Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, on behalf of our Department of Psychiatry, it is uh, my great pleasure to be introducing tonight's event. Um, the, the work of Rick Dalvin and Michael Mithelfer really s speaks from the heart of psychiatry's central mission, which is to study and provide substances that provide relief from suffering. And um, we feel so privileged tonight to have them here to review the results of their study on MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD. Um, at a time when research involving psychedelics is restricted, it takes such perseverance to complete a study of this quality. And um, it's a pioneering moment, not just for our field, but also for the hope that it provides to our patients uh, at a time of such need. So uh, I would uh, please help me in welcoming uh, the founder and director of MAPS, Rick Dalton. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome here uh, tonight. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining us on this incredible adventure that we're embarking on and have been embarking on. MAPS was founded in uh, 1986, so this is our 26th year. And the adventure as I see it is a transformation that I've been trying to make in my own life and I feel that uh, speaking here in San Francisco, it's kind of the hub of the psychedelic movement, that uh, in 1971 and 72 is when I decided that I wanted to devote myself to becoming a psychedelic therapist and also recognize that I needed psychedelic therapy myself. And at the time I woke up, things were just shutting down all over the world. The research was um, criminalized uh, and completely blocked. And it was an overreaction to the kind of tumult of the counterculture and the association of the psychedelics with the um, anti-Vietnam War movement, with um, sort of challenges of the status quo. And I think that there was a big confusion in our society that ended up identifying um, psychedelics as somehow inherently needing to be um, counterculture and somehow or other corrosive of society. And if we look, there are a series of societies around the world that have successfully integrated psychedelics with uh, ayahuasca in um, South America, the Native American church and throughout North America, half a million members of the Native American church legally use peyote and they've integrated that and it's sustaining their society. So that what we have is examples where, uh, even from our Western culture, uh, for 2,000 years, the Eleusinian mysteries that were ended in around 396 by the Catholic Church, they were the longest running mystery ceremonies and they were involving uh, psychedelic potion, kikion, that was taken. So that we have in our own Western culture historical roots of Psychedelics, and by psychedelics, what I'm really trying to talk about is not the drug, but the experiences, which are human experiences of a sense of connection, a sense of uh, mystical unity, a sense of um, sort of this um, process kind of like dreaming, in a way, where our unconscious is more accessible to us. The, the psychedelics are just tools, and they can produce more balanced human beings. And what I recognized when I was um, 18 years old, was that I was emotionally uh, underdeveloped and spiritually underdeveloped and intellectually overdeveloped, and the society seemed to mirror that, that we had incredible technologies that could uh, do wonderful things, but could also destroy the world, but we didn't have the spiritual and the emotional capacity to deal with the incredible intellectual evolution that we've been through. So it seems as if we're more and more realizing that we need to do an integration process, uh, both in individuals and societies, and that we need to bring um, things more in harmony. And the drug war itself is part of a way in which um, not just the drugs, but the states of mind that they can bring out are being suppressed. So the adventure, um, as I saw it, when I was 18, I was also a draft resistor. So I, uh, was planning to go to jail to protest the Vietnam War. And so I, I saw myself as kind of a counterculture drug criminal. <laughs> and, and so the arc of what I've been trying to do with my life and what I've been trying to do with psychedelics and with maps is to move from being this 
sort of suppressed um, underground to becoming mainstream. So, uh, you know, wearing a suit is part of that. Um, I also um, studied with Stan Groff, to the world's leading psychedelic therapist uh, in the holotropic breathwork. And then I also went to Harvard and have a master's and a PhD from the Kennedy School of Government and focused on the regulation of the medical use of psychedelics and marijuana. So I, I feel that I'm becoming um, more and more part of the um, mainstream culture and I'm doing it by not abandoning the things that I thought of when I was young and the idealistic visions that I had then, but by carrying them along with me. And what came about for me was in 1982, I learned about MDMA. And at the time it was legal. And there was this underground network of psychiatrists and therapists that had worked with MDMA. I didn't know they existed. But I found out that there was this vibrant network. And at the same time, there was this public use of ecstasy. And so it was pretty clear that history was going to repeat itself. This was in the time of the Nancy Reagan, just say no era. So the crackdown was inevitable. And what I felt that I should do was to try to help organize the therapeutic community to try to protect the therapeutic use of MDMA. And that we had this incredible opportunity when it was legal to introduce it to people who would not otherwise uh, take an illegal drug. And I worked with Robert Mueller, the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, who's written a book called New Genesis, Shaping a Global Spirituality. And his thesis was that we have the United Nations to try to mediate conflicts between nations, but a lot of these conflicts are actually um, religious-based. Um, Amy here, I just want to speak about her a second, because <laughs> um, she's an example of this mainstreaming that I'm talking about. We are so fortunate at MAPS to have uh, this arc that, that um, Albert Hoffman worked at Sandoz, a pharmaceutical company, when he developed LSD and when he developed uh, psilocybin. Sandoz was later gobbled up by other pharmaceutical companies, and then they were gobbled up, and then um, Novartis was the big pharmaceutical company, one of the world's leading ones that um, ended up owning the archives and things from Sandoz. And so Amy has come to MAPS from, from Novartis and is guiding our clinical development team in how to uh, manage and monitor all of our clinical studies. So we have the wisdom of the pharmaceutical industry linked back to uh, Albert Hoffman and to the origins of LSD and psilocybin, helping little MAPS try to become um, a pharmaceutical company. So we are actually, um, so, so we struggled, we sued the DEA, we were able to win administrative law judge hearings saying that MDMA should be protected, but the DEA rejected that recommendation. And we sued in the appeals court, we won several times, eventually the um, DEA won. And so it was clear to me that the only way in our current cultural context that we would be able to get MDMA back was through the FDA. And it was also clear that there was what we would call a market failure, that all the psychedelics are off patent. They're natural substances or they're synthetics that have been invented a long time ago, so that they're not profit centers for the pharmaceutical industry. Not only that, but they're not meant to be given as daily drugs. They're meant to be given only a few times as an adjunct to psychotherapy. So the pharmaceutical companies aren't interested in working with these substances. The government is still too wedded to the drug war to want to fund research into the benefits of drugs that they're trying to scare people from doing at all. And the major foundations are still a little bit cautious about it. So what I felt was we needed a uh, nonprofit pharmaceutical company. I actually started calling MAPS the People's Pharmaceutical Company <laughs> uh, because of tens of millions of people doing psychedelics. And so I, I had this thought that if we could just unify this group, in some ways, everybody contribute a little, that we could build up the resources and do the research in speaking the language that the FDA wanted, and that then we would be able to persuade them. And we all know that um, irrational forces are stronger than the rational forces. <laughs> but that over time, I guess this is the, the idealistic uh, hope, I don't think it's that naive, is that over time, the, the rational thought will 
have an impact. And that the demonization and the fear that portrayed MDMA for a long time as one dose permanent brain damage, and that you should take uh, under no circumstances you or try it, or like on Oprah, that you'd get holes in your brain, <laughs> where she showed a brain scan that was doctored, completely um, fraudulent brain scan showing holes in the brain. That that kind of social demonization was so out of sync with the actual um, potential of MDMA that somehow or other, over time, there would be this rebalancing. And so MAPS is now working to, to bring that about. And so we're operating at the level of the major pharmaceutical companies, doing research. We have a tremendous relationship with the FDA. Um, one of my dissertation advisors was the former chief counsel for the FDA. He's the leading expert in the country on FDA drug regulation, and he's been advising us. And um, even though today's gonna be about um, MDMA, I'll just say one word about marijuana, which is, because um, we're here in the heart of <laughs> marijuana, is that, uh, <laughs> it, it is that we're trying to do a study with marijuana for PTSD, and we have FDA approval for it, and the National Institute on Drug Abuse uh, has a monopoly on the supply of marijuana, and they will not sell it to us if you want to make marijuana into a prescription medicine. If you want to study what's wrong with it, no problem. <laughs> But if you want to study what's right with it, how it can be beneficial in certain circumstances, it's something that's not possible to get. So we're making great strides with um, psychedelic research around the world. And we've built this alliance with the FDA. The FDA is not pro-psychedelic, not pro-medical marijuana, but they're pro-science over politics. And that's all that we're asking. All we need is an even playing field and that we can then demonstrate the values. And what we've tried to do is to think strategically what kind of uh, people would we treat, who would be our patients, and which would be the psychedelic drug that would be the combination that would be most likely to make it through the FDA. And so we, for a bunch of reasons which I um, don't have time to talk about right now, um, we, we've selected um, MDMA and post-traumatic stress disorder and increasingly, we're focusing on veterans. And we're trying to look at veterans who are uh, from Iraq, Afghanistan, Vietnam. We're working in Israel with the Israeli Defense Forces. We're working in Switzerland. We're even moving towards trying to enroll police officers and firefighters also. So we're trying to work with the symbols of uh, the people that culture generally highly values and showing that, again, in a sense, this psychedelic community, this counterculture that we're now trying to merge back in. And I think that after 40 years, that the, the dominant culture has matured in a lot of different ways. There's hospice centers, there's birthing centers, there's yoga, there's meditation, there's understanding of all these things. So that I think we're now ready for the integration of psychedelics back into the culture. And I'm imagining that it will take around another 10 years. And then from that, it'll probably take another 30 years to kind of um, move it so that it's so taken for granted that every town has a psychedelic treatment clinic. <laughs> and that's what our goal is. And so now I'd like to introduce Michael Minover, who is uh, the psychiatrist that, with his wife Annie, are the male-female co-therapist team that lead our efforts uh, and teach other therapists, have developed a treatment manual, and are doing the hardest work with the most difficult patients. And so, uh, Michael, it's been um, a pleasure for these last uh, 12 years to be working with you. Um, and well, I have a pretty high risk tolerance, and I should say that Michael and I have a similar risk tolerance, <laughs> more than most others, and so we're willing to go into these challenging areas. And I think once you uh, listen to Michael and see what we're doing, um, if you want to lend your support, that's the only way that it can actually happen. Um, and uh, I'll just conclude by saying that one week, um, a couple years ago, we got a check for um, $250,000, and we got an envelope that had eight stamps that was from a drug war prisoner. And I felt that each of those donations was equivalent in a way, in terms of the inspiration, that somebody who had nothing that was in prison would send eight stamps to us, and that someone who was a billionaire would send us $250,000. If we can unify, everybody can just be motivated and, and share what they can, and then collectively we'll be able to 
uh, transform our society. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it really is a team. You know, uh, it's been uh, working with MAPS for 12 years now. It, it's certainly teamwork with you know, all the people at MAPS and all the supporters that make this possible. And my wife and I work as a team, and I'm sorry Annie can't be here, but she's her mom's 80th birthday this weekend. So, um, And it's really, well, what a nice crowd, what a nice group. But, you know, I know that San Francisco is the kind of um, birthplace or source of the psychedelic culture. I was in college in the late 60s, and not here, but I did make some trips out here, so I got a bit of it, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> So I know that's true, but I, you know, I've got to say, I was a little worried about you that you were kind of losing your edge, because I'm coming from South Carolina, which is now the hotbed of MDMA research in the world, and I'm coming to San Francisco to kind of bring you, try to bring you up to date on what's happening. <laughs> but uh, I was reassured when James, uh, you know, I heard a young psychiatrist from San Francisco say that this is the core mission of psychiatry, so I guess you're, you're really not losing your head as much as I feared. So what, what I would like to do, you know, um, Brian was just saying, I spoke at the Palo Alto VA at noon today, and Brian was saying earlier when we got here, this is kind of a group that's halfway between the VA and the normal MAPS conference. So I'm going to try to give a talk that's kind of halfway in between. So I, I want to give really an update of what we're doing with kind of the nuts and bolts of the studies, but not really take the time for too much detail because I also would like to have time to read some quotes from the veterans that are in our study now to give you kind of a flavor of what this process is like, as well as um, kind of describe the research. Um, I don't have references on most of the slides, but this is a great source that uh, Ilsa Jerome keeps current about all of English literature on MBMA. Um, so I'm just going to touch a little bit on the history of MBMA, and the, um, I think a lot of people are probably familiar with this, but then um, and explain a little bit about why we thought uh, a good idea to study MDMA for PTSD in addition to what Rick was talking about, and then tell you a little bit about our, about our clinical trials and, and then some quotes. Um, you know, MDMA looks a little bit like methamphetamine and a little bit like mescaline, which sort of makes sense. It's been off patent now for many years. It was actually first synthesized 100 years ago in 1912 and patented in 1914. So, uh, MAPS is the only drug company interested in it, since they're not trying to make a profit. Um, and, you know, it is different from uh, classic psychedelics like psilocybin and LSD, so uh, Dave Nichols suggested the term tactogen to refer to its quality of putting people in touch with their own inner world and, and con more contact with others. And, you know, the pharmacological profile is, is quite complex. A lot of it is uh, monoamine release, especially serotonin. There's also affinity for receptors, including 5-HT2, and as well as um, other receptors, histamine, norepinephrine, ACTH. And there's um, elevation of all these hormone levels. Uh, maybe the most interesting in terms of psychological effect being oxytocin and prolactin. And as Rick said, it was put in uh, Schedule 1 by the VA in 1985. And before that, though, it was used by a number of psychiatrists and psychologists and other therapists as a catalyst for treat therapy. It was not a legal drug except for those three months when Rick forced them into putting it in Schedule 3. But it wasn't illegal either until 85. So it's not the idea of using it for therapy is not new, it's just that in those days no one did any controlled research. They, they did write some case reports, but no controlled trials, so we're trying to pick up that thread. Um, 
you know, made that before we started, part of the, you know, the history of MDMA has been in some ways uh, kind of a burden for us because there's so much prejudice, prejudgment about it um, as being dangerous or, you know, it has a reputation because of recreational use and a lot of false information like Rick was talking about. But the, good, the upside of that is that a lot of, um, we got a lot of free research paid for by the governments around the world who are studying it because it's being used recreationally. So the preclinical studies have been done. When we uh, started in uh, 2001, there have been phase one trials, you know, giving it to normal volunteers just to test safety and pharmacology. Those have been done in the US and Europe. Just a word about toxicity. You know, this is a, a big subject and pretty controversial. There's no question that MDMA can have serious acute toxicity. Sometimes people die uh, at rave, so it, it definitely is not to be taken lightly, although the toxicity is quite rare given the um, number of people that take MDMA. Um, there's evidence in animal models of changes in serotonin receptors with high doses. Uh, argument about how much that applies to humans, but probably not very much. And then there are a lot of studies in recreational users, which are always very difficult to interpret because they're almost always retrospective, and one never knows what the level of functioning was before people took MDMA, or even what they were taking and what other drugs they were taking. But actually, the best studies in recreational users are fairly reassuring about that, we really haven't found much. But for us, what's most important is the data in clinical trials, the safety data, um, and now there have been more than 500 people in phase one and phase two trials around the world getting MDMA with no serious drug-related adverse events and no evidence of neurotoxicity, and we have some data on that that I'll show you. You know, it's very clear that we need better therapies for PTSD. There are a number of existing treatments that do help people. Um, you know, prolonged exposure and cognitive processing therapy are the best research. There's also other, many other kinds of psychotherapy, EMDR, and there, a lot of um, drugs are used too, even though there are only two drugs approved that have an FDA indication for PTSD, Zoloft and Paxil, uh, certainly and Paroxetine. But many drugs are used, but sometimes with, you know, most of them without real evidence that they work. So, you know, even in the best hands, um, when you count for dropouts, the, probably uh, at least half of the people don't respond adequately to existing treatments. And I don't think many people would argue with the fact that that's a, you know, that it's a large percentage, whatever exactly it is. That's several million people in the U.S. alone every year. And now, of course, um, with the veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, it's getting to be more and more of a, a serious problem. It's, the data is, it's hard to pin down, but it probably at least 18% of vets returning now have um, PTSD. I just read that so far 400,000 veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan have been put on uh, service-connected disability for mental illness, which is mostly PTSD. And the vets that we're seeing are telling us that there are many, many veterans that quite obviously have PTSD that won't go to the VA. So these are probably underestimates. So it's a really serious problem. And a study in 2010 from the San Francisco VA and UCSF, um, Dr. Seal et al. found that of the people that screen positive for PTSD in their own system, fewer than 10% got what was considered adequate treatment. So, and that's not for a lot of trying, but we just don't have enough resources and we don't have good enough treatments. Yes. <laughs> Some of us do, but a lot of them don't. <laughs> So, you know, why MDMA for PTSD? Well, it's clear that even though some drugs can decrease symptoms for PTSD, 
it takes psychotherapy to cure it. And, you know, sometimes, as I said, that does work if it's getting some treatments. But if you look at some of the reasons it doesn't work, they tend to have to do with fear, you know, too much uh, anxiety coming up, people get overwhelmed by their feelings when they're trying to process the trauma, so they're either not willing to, or when they try to do it, it's either ineffective or even um, re-traumatizing. That's one reason. Another reason is like defensiveness and numbing. You know, people with PTSD uh, often have a high degree of emotional numbing, especially veterans. And so they may, the defensiveness may cause them to avoid treatment altogether, but often, you know, they may, if they try to do, say, prolonged exposure, they may be able to report on the trauma and talk about it, but not connect emotionally. They just kind of report it. And when that happens, there's a lot of evidence from all these other therapies that they, they don't work in that case either. So, so both, both things interfere. And also, a lot of people with PTSD have a real problem with trust, and so it's hard to form a therapeutic alliance. So figures, we recognize figures. Um, <laughs> if MDMA decreases fear and defensiveness and increases trust, it might be a good catalyst to get people over these obstacles to successful treatment. So that's, that's our main thinking. In addition, I think a, another part of the effectiveness is that um, some, you know, MDMA is apt to also bring people some affirming positive experiences, and um, that can be corrected also. It may help them kind of correct their negative, negatively skewed view of the world. So that's, that's our thinking. And this illustrates it. Um, this is from Pat Ogden's book, Trauma and the Body. And, um, What's the name of the book? Trauma and the Body. Pat Ogden is the, one of the authors. So this, uh, you know, this is a pretty well described idea in other kinds of therapy. That if this is the level of arousal, hyper arousal up here, hypo arousal down here, um, the in either case, if you have hyperarousal or hypoarousal, uh, it's not a good situation for therapeutic change. The, the therapy happens in this zone of tolerance, window of tolerance or optimal arousal, arousal zone, where there's people are either you know, overcome by emotion, having their cognitive processing disorganized, nor are they numbed out and um, sort of disabled cognitive processing. It's this zone in the middle that where the therapy happens. And this is described like with prolonged exposure. Edna Foer refers to who's the leading researcher in prolonged exposure. She refers to over-engagement or under-engagement. Now they have heard this for years that therapy doesn't work if people are in these extremes. And people with PTSD often go to these extremes very uh, frequently. So our thinking is MDMA may, or does seem to give people several hours in that optimal arousal zone so that they can then process the trauma in a way that they hadn't been able to before. And, you know, there are many ways to look at the possible effects. You know, just as sort of as an aside, we're not really studying the mechanism, we're studying whether it works or not. So these are kind of thoughts about how it may work, which we're very interested in, but we don't have data from our studies for that. But, um, you know, this neurocircuitry model of PTSD is about PTSD being a defect in uh, fear conditioning, fear ex extinction of fear conditioning. And that's mediated by the amygdala, hippocampus, and prefrontal cortex. And we know in people with PTSD, you know, they have observed these changes of um, reduced hippocampal volume, increased activity in amygdala, and decreased activity in the prefrontal cortex, that happens in people with PTSD. In different group, normal volunteers, we know that MDMA causes, in some ways, the opposite. Increases in blood flow in the ventral medial prefrontal cor cortex and other areas and decrease activity in the left amygdala. So nobody has yet measured before and after MDMA in 
you know, done functional scanning before and after MDMA and PTSD patients, but we'd certainly like to do that sometime. But at least this kind of gives a theory that would fit, and it sort of fits with that arousal zone model as well. So this is our first study, a phase two trial. You know, phase two meaning the first study is when uh, the drug is given to people with a diagnosis to test the treatment effects, as opposed to phase one where you're just testing safety. And this is, a, this is also about testing safety, uh, but in, in patients, not in normal volunteers. So these were people with chronic, treatment-resistant PTSD. Um, and just to give you an idea of the time course, we got FDA approval quite quickly in 2001, and then it took until February 2004 to get IRB and DEA approvals. Uh, if we gave Rick another couple of hours, he could explain the interesting course of that. But, uh, Suffice it to say that the DEA was not eager to expedite the process. Uh, <laughs> but as Rick kept saying, that the government is not unitary, and there are rules. So if you're persistent, you can get them to follow their own rules. <laughs> so we, you know, a month after we got approval from DEA in 2004, we enrolled our first person and we finished the study in September 2008. It was published in the journal Psychopharmacology in the summer of 2010. So this was a double-blind placebo-controlled trial. We used inactive placebo and MDMA. Uh, there were 20 treatment-resistant people. We did have, actually have 21 people. The 21st was a veteran who uh, was misdiagnosed. Actually, when he was on active duty, he went to a, a um, he was sent to a contract therapist who told him he was depressed. And he was a bright guy, a Marine officer, and he didn't believe that, so he didn't want to take so long. So he had never actually gotten treatment. And he did well in the study too, but we don't count him because he isn't part of the um, protocol of people being treatment resistant. So this meant people had to have had uh, at least three months of an SSRI, a serotonin uh, reuptake inhibitor like Prozac or SNRI, and uh, also have had at least six months of therapy. Uh, in fact, most people have had years of therapy and many different drugs, is that the average duration of PTSD in these people was over 19 years. Um, and it was mostly crime-related PTSD. That's what we started out studying. With mostly childhood sexual abuse or rape. We added veterans right at the end, uh, but only had two, two veterans. So that's why we've now gone on to it. another study with veterans. But this was mostly non-veterans. You know, when we applied for our first protocol approval, the Iraq war hadn't started yet. Uh, so in the, there were two stages in the protocol. In the first stage, 60% of people received MDMA on two occasions or three occasions, and 40% received placebo on two occasions. The reason it's two or three is we changed the protocol partway through because it was a pilot study, but actually all the data I'm going to show you is based on two sessions, because that was our original design. That's kind of a more conservative way of analyzing it. Um, and then there was a stage two, an open label crossover arm, in which people who got randomized to placebo in the first stage could then go through the whole thing again with open label MDMA. And this was not take home MDMA. You know? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> people got MDMA under our direct um, well, support, not supervision really, but supervision and support. So they, they took the MDMA in MDMA and or placebo in all day sessions with male and female co-therapists there, myself and my wife. Um, and so they're, you know, we were with them for at least eight hours. Then they'd stay overnight in the clinic with the nurse there. We, we'd come back and meet with them the next day. We would talk to them every day on the phone for a week. 
and we would meet with them every week in between until a month later when they'd have their next session. So um, there was a lot, you know, um, a lot of uh, attention to um, both prep with these additional non-drug sessions, a lot of attention to preparing people for the experience and then to helping them integrate it afterwards, which was very important because it wasn't just like a magic bullet. It was a process that unfolded over time and it was very important to have good support. And we measured the blood pressure every 15 minutes and the pulse and the temperature every hour. This is where we do the sessions. Um, the participant either lies or sits on a futon and Andy and I sit on either side. We've got um, eye shades and headphones. So it's a pretty aesthetically pleasing, very quiet and private uh, room. There's a bathroom right behind that blue chair so people are in a really nice protected space. <clears throat> and our approach is a very non-directive approach you know, aimed at supporting people's experience, however it emerges for them, with the idea that their own inner healing intelligence is the best guide for what happens, and we're there to support and facilitate that, but not to direct it too much. And there are alternating periods of inner focus without talking, during which usually people have headphones listening to music and eye shades, and then those alternate with periods of talking to us, and we encourage people to have some of each. It's usually about half and half, maybe, but there's no schedule for that. Each person develops their own rhythm. Um, you know, sometimes we'll say to people, if they've been talking a while, we'll say, you know, this might be a good time to go back inside now and just see where, where that goes. Or sometimes people will be talking to us and they'll say, okay, it's, I think it's time to go back inside. And they'll pull their mask down and they'll lie back down. So people get the hang of it pretty fast. And we now have written a treatment manual describing the method, you know, which at first the idea of treatment manual was kind of anathema to us because it seemed like this was too non-directive, too intuitive. Um, it didn't fit with my idea of what manuals were like um, that are usually much more um, directive. But we've, we realized we had to have one if this research was going to move forward, so we decided we should be able to describe what we do. So I think we've done a pretty good job of describing what's necessary, but also allowing a lot of uh, latitude for the therapists to approach things the way they feel they should. And we have now have um, adherence measures, so independent readers can watch our videos and videos and other studies that we're working on. and see if the manual is being adhered to. Actually, a couple of our wonderful um, adherence raiders are right here, so it's great to see them. San Francisco is a hotbed of uh, adherence raiders. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is an important point. Uh, several people in the studies have said, I don't know why they call this ecstasy. And most people have said something like that. So it's not that people came in and just had an ecstatic experience and then everything was fine. You know, it was people, I'd say virtually always, or always had some, some very positive, affirming experiences. But a lot of it was not that. A lot of it was very hard and painful work with a lot of painful emotion, rage, grief, um, fear, shame coming up. So the MDMA, help them feel that they can stay with that and, and you know, kind of like, I can do this even though it's very painful. And, and, you know, at the same time, actually, often the MDMA, for people who had a lot of emotional numbing that hadn't felt this, the MDMA helped them access the emotions, but not feel overwhelmed. So, you know, people would tell us things like, um, this has changed my relationship with my emotions. I know I don't have to avoid them now, even without the MDMA. Uh, the screening and outcome measures were done by a psychologist not involved in the treatment, which we think is important. Um, we had several outcome measures. The primary one was the clinician administered PTSD scale, which is kind of the gold standard of PTSD symptom measures. It's the same one that was used in the Zoloft and Paxil trials 
that led to their getting FDA indication for PTSD. So we wanted to use the same one. And we also use these other scales. Um, so in a nutshell, these were our results. This was the phase one, the double blind phase. Um, these are the mean cap scores. The cap scores on the vertical axis, these are the time points. One is baseline. Two is four days after the first MDMA or placebo session. Three is four days after the second session. And four is two months after the second session. So placebo is in blue, MDMA is in orange. And you can see they, they had almost identical mean scores at baseline, about 80, just under 80. And the placebo people had actually uh, quite a bit of drop in the caps. You know, these sessions um, did have an effect for some people. Uh, we had two placebo responders out of eight. Uh, so this was a statistically significant difference. But, you know, this includes the two people who had placebo response. So most people actually did not improve. And the cutoff for study entry was 50. So, you know, this was still, they still had significant PTSD. Whereas, as you can see, you don't need a lot of statistics to uh, explain this. Uh, there was a difference. Um, and, and the p value was uh, less than 0.05. So, you know, the MDMA group had a much faster drop and it continued to drop. So the spread was maintained at about 33 points. 50 points better than baseline with MDMA and 33 points better than placebo. And you know, you can't really compare studies, but just to give you a feel for those of you who aren't familiar with the caps, Zoloft got FDA, FDA indication for PTSD with a little less than seven points better than uh, placebo. So this is amazing. Wow. <laughs> um, so then stage two, you know, after going through that, first stage, the people who got placebo could go through the whole thing again, uh, two or three MDMA sessions uh, with the same integration sessions, and 78 placebo subjects elected to do that. And this is what happened there. Um, cap score, the vertical axis. This was the baseline after placebo. So after having placebo and all the uh, set therapy that went with it, it, you know, it's not really placebo, it's really therapy only. It's, placebo is kind of a shorthand, but it's the same therapy. So, because this is not just a drug trial, this is a drug-assisted therapy trial. So the therapy only group had a mean caps of 65.6 after all the therapy only. And then when they got MDMA, they had a net over 30 point drop, just like the first group. So as far as the um, neurotoxicity question, we did a battery of neuropsychological tests before and after MDMA and placebo. The most comprehensive one is this R bands, and um, but the, the results were similar for all three. So I'm just going to show you the R bands. Here's the R band score: higher is better in this case. Um, and MDMA on the left, placebo on the right. The darker brown is the baseline, and the lighter one is the after the MDMA, after two MDMA sessions, or after two placebo sessions. So absolutely no evidence of any neurotoxicity. So that was the first study. Then uh, we decided we should go back and see what happened, see how long this effect lasted, because our, our last measurement was at two, two months after the final MDMA session. So we went back a year or more later repeated the CAPS and the IES and the NEO and also gave people a questionnaire. Um, and here's what happened with that. Uh, it, because the study enrollment happened over four plus years and we didn't start the um, follow-up until the end, it was actually arranged. When people took the CAPS, it was 17 to 74 months after their last MDMA session, mean of 45 months. So here was their baseline before MDMA. Here's the mean score at two months, and here's the mean score at three and a half years. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, there is one caveat, you can see the N is 16 here. So 
although all 20 people did the questionnaire for different reasons, three people didn't, well, let me back up a little bit. There were 20, one person never got MDMA, so that left us with 19 in the follow-up. And of those 19, 16 took the caps. So it is possible, we had two people that relapsed in this group, and they're included in this data, so actually without them, the score, mean score would be lower. But um, two people relapsed, the score is about 50. The three who didn't take the caps reported on their questionnaires that they were still doing well, so we don't believe they relapsed. But if you want to be conservative and assume, well, the questionnaire wasn't a, a, you know, an established measure, so it, it's possible that these people would have had high cap scores. But even then, um, if you assume then five people had, didn't have a positive outcome, it still would be 74% of the group uh, that had maintained their benefits. So somewhere between 74 and 87%, depending on whether you include those three. So it was a very encouraging uh, result in terms of the durability of these changes from two or three MDMA-assisted sessions in people who had been previously treatment resistant to therapy and medication. So what are we, here's what we're doing now. Um, we have a six-day training program for training therapists that are going to work in other studies to train them, you know, not how to be therapists, but how to do, how to approach this in a way that's consistent with our manual. So we train several teams now from uh, Colorado and uh, Israel and Jordan and Vancouver um, to work in other studies. And then we thought it would be very good for people that are going to be therapists in these studies to have their own experience with MDMA. So for those who hadn't, we um, applied to FDA for a study to give them an MDMA session and we got permission for that. So it's actually a phase one trial. We're, we're measuring some few things. But it's, you know, it's restricted to people who have finished our non-drug training program and want to have their own experience. And, and we've already had a couple people uh, come to do that, so that, that study is open. Uh, we're doing a relapse study for the um, people that relapsed in, in phase, in the first study. Um, we got permission to give them one more MDMA assisted session to see if that would kind of put them back where they were, because they, what they told us is they'd done well for quite some time. Um, you, actually more than a couple of years, because the people that relapsed were people that came, that had finished quite some time ago. And so far, we, one person has come for that, and she had a very good result. Her caps had gone way back up, and with one session, um, when we brought, the camp, brought her back for a two-month follow-up, her caps was way, way down. So it appears that at least for some people, a little booster session uh, can be helpful. And then, we're, you know, as I said, we're using the manual and the adherence measures for our current studies, all, all the current studies and future studies. And here's what those studies are. Um, these are all MAP-sponsored studies, and um, all except this bottom one are MDMA. Well, that's not true. The, the England study that may happen is not going to be uh, really sponsored by MAPS, but uh, their MAPS is helping them. So the, the study in Switzerland, which is very similar to ours, only uh, 12 subjects, that's finished and that's in the process of being, um, you know, working on getting it published. Uh, the study in Israel was recently initiated. There are studies in Colorado, Vancouver, and Australia that are in the approval process. There's one in Jordan that's in the approval process. It's gotten a little hung up. And then there's a study that MAPS helped to start, um, isn't directly the sponsor, of using MDMA for end-of-life anxiety at Harvard, although they haven't um, recruited anybody recently, but that's, that is an approved study. And then the one that we're doing, the main thing we're doing now is a new U.S. study with military veterans with PTSD that is, is a dose-response design because um, one of the problems
problems, one of the limitations of the first study was that the blind was transparent to us. You know, we could guess whether people got an active placebo or an <laughs> uh, We were never wrong, although there were a couple times when we weren't positive. But we were always right. Because, you know, we, unlike some drug studies in which it's kind of like a don't ask, don't tell policy toward the blind, um, people can tell from side effects they probably could guess, but that's not part of the protocol. In our protocol, we had to write down what we thought they got. We had to ask them to write down what they thought they got. So it was, in fact, true. We always guessed right. And um, usually the subjects did. A couple of times they didn't. But um, usually they did. So that was a weakness in the design, which, as you can imagine, is pretty challenging to um, overcome with this kind of research. But we were trying to do that. So the idea with the dose was, well, with the slide. It's a randomized uh, triple blind study that the monitor, the, uh, the, the rater that rates the symptoms and the investigators and the subjects are all blinded. Um, that was true in the first one too. We just changed the terminology to replace triple blind. <laughs> um, and we're comparing now three different doses of MDMA in uh, conjunction with that the same approach to therapy. So far it's been all veterans, but it is now open to firefighters and police officers, as Rick said, and these are people with chronic PTSD um, that have been resistant to uh, either medication or therapy. Instead of, in the first study, it's both, this is either. Part of the reason for that is veterans have a great deal of difficulty getting uh, any substantial amount of psychotherapy, it appears. Uh, so the same, same cutoff in caps at 50. Uh, everything is very similar to the first study, except now they get either 30, 75, or 125 milligrams of MDMA, each followed by half the original dose in an hour and a half to two hours. And it's the same eight-hour session with us, uh, very similar schedule of uh, non-drug sessions to prepare them for it and to help them integrate it. And we're doing outcome measures this time. Uh, in the first stage, we do outcome measures one month after the second session. And then we break the blind. And then if people got full dose twice, then they get one more full dose session in stage two. If they got lower medium dose twice, then they get three full dose sessions in stage two. So everybody can have three full dose sessions, ultimately. And then we do follow-up measures at two months and one year. Uh, you know, it's too early to, to say much about the results, and I don't think I'm going to show you those preliminary results, so I have time to do some quotes, but it's, it's looking encouraging. We've had nine veterans enroll, um, and five have completed all the sessions now. We've had two dropouts, and interestingly, one of the dropouts um, got medium dose, and the reason he dropped out is because he was better. And he didn't want it, he didn't need any more. And part of what he got in his session was that um, he wasn't really being honest with himself or us about his prescription opiate use. He'd been taking oxycodone for his back injury in the war. And in his session, he got that, wait, I'm not really taking that for my back. I'm taking it to make me feel better, and I don't want to do that anymore. And so he told us afterwards, Part of what he came to is, I don't want any substances, I don't need any substances to change my, the way I'm feeling, and that included MDMA. So the MDMA, one time, taught him he didn't need any more MDMA. And he was able to talk about his trauma in a way he never had with his family and his friends, and said that, I don't need that more. So that was kind of impressive. And he, uh, both these dropouts agreed to come to follow up. And that one person who had one session and had a very big drop in his caps, came for his one-year follow-up uh, a few weeks ago, and his caps is still down. So his benefit from one medium dose session was maintained for a year. The other person dropped out because he got a, had a low dose session that was so difficult, he didn't want to go on. Um, and, you know, it's been, so far, they've been, all the combat trauma has been um, from Iraq six men and one woman, and then we also include military sexual trauma, and which is a, a really big problem.
two. We've had two women with that so far. And we have we now have a Vietnam vet that's in the middle of screening, along with an Iraq vet and a, another person with military sexual trauma. And it's we haven't had to do any recruiting. You know, the first study it took us a long time to recruit enough people. We had not done recruiting. There's been some media attention and a couple articles in the website military.com. And so far we've had, when I left home, 220 uh, veterans have called us about participating. And I know there have been more since then. You know, they're coming in sometimes several calls a day. And so they're calling much faster than we can possibly enroll them. So it, it kind of, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking, really. But it shows what the need is. I think I'm going to I'm going to read the quotes in a second. I'm, I'm just going to skip ahead. I'm not showing you most of the data. Oops. <laughs> so much for improvising. Um, I just wanted to show you one thing we're doing in this study with the veterans, which we're measuring. We're using something called the post-traumatic growth inventory, which because in the first study, people talked a lot about. except for this one person who didn't have an improvement. Uh, all these other people are, you know, scoring a large amount of growth that went with the MDMA sessions, which is not a surprise, but it's, it's nice to know that maybe there's some way we can measure that. So, how am I doing for time? Okay. So, um, what? Two minutes, okay. So, um, you know, we're focused on getting hard data for the FDA, so I, I'm not putting these quotes out to represent what we're claiming is proof of the MDMA efficacy. We're still focusing on the objective data, but I think it's uh, interesting, and um, I think you might be interested in hearing a little bit more about what the process is like and what the veterans are telling us. Um, and that, I'm going to start with a couple, that, um, a couple things people just said to me in the last few days. Um, the person who just had his first session uh, told me on the phone the day before yesterday, um, he said, I feel a deeper, more connected sense of peace with myself. It's kind of subtle, but it's, more it's a more established sense of peace different from the fleeting sense that I sometimes had in the past. He also told me that for the first time in nine years he was sleeping really well, taking only melatonin, not uh, Ambien. That's a, this is a week after his first session. And then I was talking to a, uh, a Marine veteran who finished, uh, I guess about seven months ago, and he was talking about his concern for other veterans. Uh, and he said, you know, being in Iraq was bad, but as bad as it was, for me what was worse was coming back and having my body back here, but part of my mind still in Iraq. That was even worse. And he said, being in the study allowed me to bring the rest of me home. And I'm aware of so many other veterans who 
bodies here, but they haven't come home yet. And it's really, really moving to hear how much concern there is for other veterans and these, these young people. Um, and I'm going to read you one study, one quote from the first study, and then the rest are going to be all veterans. This person said, I don't think I would have survived another year. It's like night and day for me compared to other methods of therapy. Without MDMA, I didn't even know where I needed to go. Maybe one of the things the drug does is let your mind relax and get out of the way because the mind is so protective of the injury. I just think that's a good explanation of how it works. Um, so this person said, um, this was the first person who had a one-year follow-up. She said, it's helped me in so many ways. It feels like it's gradually rewiring my brain. It feels like the MDMA sessions were the crack in the ice because the trauma was so solid before that. It took a long time to integrate, and it was confusing, but gradually I found, this means the MDMA sessions, it took a long time for her to integrate. It was confusing, but gradually I found that I could get back to that kind of state on my own. It was incredibly intense around the MDMA sessions. It was a lot, like a big bubble from the unconscious that popped. It brought up a lot and it took time to slow down and integrate. Um, and this person said, uh, this was like 12 days after their second session, he said, it, it feels like the inner healer or the MDMA is like a maid doing spring cleaning. It's as if you thought you were cleaning before, but when you got the things you didn't really want to deal with, you just stuck them in the attic. <laughs> if you're going to clean the house, you can't skip the stuff in the attic. This person said, um, I keep getting the message from the medicine, this was during the session, I keep getting the message from the medicine, trust me. When I try to think, it doesn't work out. But when I just let the waves of fear and anxiety come up, it feels like the medicine is going in and getting them, bringing them up, and then they dissipate. And, and this, this was great. Um, this young man said, the medicine just brought me a folder. I'm sitting at this big desk in a comfortable chair, and the medicine goes and then rematerializes in physical form, bringing me the next thing. This is a folder with my service record. It says I need to review it and talk to you about it from the beginning so it can be properly filed. Uh, after you've written the, a few of the after you've ridden a few of those waves of fear, then it gets easier and easier to trust the next one. And this is the day after, uh, this was the same man that had the image of the folders. He said, MDMA is like being the boss of a company and taking a tour of the grounds. Since you don't usually, since you don't usually work there, it's confusing. But then you see it's all going well. Everyone's doing their job. So you can go back to being yourself and trust that it's being taken care of, like a program running in the background. Uh, let's see. This was the day after the fifth session. This person said, it's like the whisper of the inner healer stays with you. Remember what you've learned. And another one about afterwards, as interesting as the sessions are, I know from experience now that it's more interesting what happens after the sessions when you're making connections. And a lot of people said things like that. Uh, and this, the guy that dropped out after one session because he was better, he said, it's like PTSD changed my brain and MDMA changed it back. This person said, once you forget, you realize there was nothing to forget. And this was the day after the first session. Uh, I realize I'm not trying to break through anything. It has to be softly opening. With the medicine, nothing felt forced. I know I'm going to have to feel the feelings, and there's still fear that the grief will be overwhelming. And I know feelings are unpredictable, and the currents can be swirly. But yesterday, when I put my toe in, it felt so wonderful to feel. But remember every detail. It's a pristine, pristine image. 
And finally, this person said, after their, a week after their first session, I used to be always jumping into the waves. Now it's more like riding the waves. <laughs>